And so I wanted to share from James 1.17 today. This is from the Passion Translation, which is one of my favorites. This is a very familiar verse. It says, every gift God freely gives us is good and perfect, streaming down from the Father of lights, who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadow or darkness and is never subject to change. So let's break that down a little bit. It says, each gift is good and perfect. I put in my notes here, like, that's amazing. I have never accomplished that. <laughs> have you ever, in your Christmas giving, accomplished that? Just every, every gift, perfect and good. Everybody's like, yes, Mom, you just nailed it on every... Uh, no, <laughs> I've never accomplished that. God, every time it says it's good and perfect, every time. It also says there's no hidden shadow or darkness. And when I looked that up in the message translation, it says there is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, and nothing fickle. And when I was thinking about that statement, I'm just like, you know, no strings attached. When he gives us a gift, there's no strings attached. There's nothing deceitful about it. He's not giving it to you for some ulterior motive so he can get you to do something else later. There's no deceit. And um, it says it's nothing that's two-faced. You know, people that are two-faced. I remember in high school, we talked about those people that were two-faced and talking behind your back. And so I'm so glad that God isn't like that. And lastly, it says that it's never subject to change. So those gifts he gives us, they won't be taken away. They're not fickle. They're never subject to change. And as I, you know, put this together, I'm like, gosh, I feel like I've really taken that for granted about God. Have I, have I really, you know, been grateful for how perfect his gifts are, how there's no strings attached, how he's not threatening to take them away? You know, I don't know. Is, is God who gives to you freely still on your list this year? Or are we so focused with the hustle and the bustle and everybody else that we're wrapping gifts for under the tree? You know, maybe, maybe we haven't been so happy about how our lives turned out this year and we kind of secretly put God on the naughty list. I know we would probably never admit to that, right? But maybe we're kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of mad right now, God. You're kind of on my naughty list. And so, you know, just be honest with yourself. He knows anyway. He knows anyway. So do you need to remind yourself about this verse? Do you need to maybe renew your mind to this verse? Amen. Sometimes men have let us down, right? Men or women, and they've given us gifts with strings attached or gifts that they choose to take away to throw in our face at a later date. God's gifts are not that way. So I want to just encourage you, to be thankful. Don't take this for granted about God, about how his gifts are good and perfect all the time. Isn't that amazing? All right, I'm going to pray, and then we'll go ahead and pass the buckets. So, Father God, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, we celebrate your goodness. Lord, we thank you that you give freely. You give freely to us, Father, and all those gifts are good and perfect. Father, that you shine from heaven on us, that there's no hidden shadow, there's no darkness, there's nothing deceitful. Lord, just continue to remind us of those things that we forget about you, that we just take for granted, Lord, that we are reminded to be thankful. And Lord, we just thank you for the generosity of those that are sitting in this room tonight or joining us online. Father, we just pray a blessing over each person. Lord, we thank you that you promise that you will provide our every need and multiply it back to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, I wanted to take a minute and introduce myself again. My name is... Uh, Trina. I'm one of the pastors here at Living Word. I think most of you might know me, but I might be new to some of you. Um, I've been here at Living Word as an attender since 1991, and I came on as a staff member in 1997 and spent a huge chunk of my career here at Living Word working at Living Free Recovery Services, which is our outpatient program for people struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. It's housed in this building. 
Um, but it's been a while since I've been here in a Wednesday night service. We've been blessed for many weeks with Pastor Dustin, right, sharing through our essential series. We've had a few other pastors and some guest ministers in there as well. But since I've been here last, um, my position has changed a bit here in the church, and I have the honor of being our chief of staff. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so that means I get to be a professional problem solver, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's not a boring job, that's for sure. Um, and there's a lot to learn. If you think about my training and my education was really based, right, in counseling and working with people, and that all comes in very handy. But I didn't know a lot about things like producing a service and about prompters and lighting and I don't know a ton about kids ministry and like if you think about it living word does a lot of stuff <laughs> there's a lot of things happening here and so trying to learn about all of those things has been enjoyable but also a little bit challenging um, and so that's kind of what's been happening with me. Hopefully you see me, you know, on the weekends, hanging out in the lobby. Please come up and introduce yourself if you haven't before. Um, I also wanted to let you know this is the last Wednesday night service of 2023. We don't have service next week. But I wanted to share a little bit like, well, what's to come in 2024? Um, as I said, Pastor Dustin, like he rocked it out this year, teaching on that essential series, and he's going to continue to be a part of our teaching team in 2024. Um, I will officially be completing the essential series tonight with what I'm going to share, but we have a lot to look forward to in 2024. Our first guest minister coming around, you probably saw the slide, will be January 3rd, so right in the new year, we have Guy Leibovitz coming, and he is going to be sharing about what is happening in Israel right now, and so we're really excited to have him share February, we have Terry Savelle Foy. April, we got Joe Morris. May, we got Joan Hunter. June, we got Jonathan Kahn. I mean, we got a big lineup coming on Wednesday nights in 2024, and so you don't want to miss it. We also have Pastor Dustin and some other of our Living Word pastors that will be rotating in to share, but we're really excited for 2024. We have our amazing worship team as well. So I want to encourage you to invite somebody Maybe there's somebody in your life that maybe they don't want to come on a weekend service when it's a little bit busy and the sanctuary's really full. That might be a bit intimidating. Wednesday night is a great time. We have invite cards in a lot of different places. And so, you know, even if you just hand somebody a card, invite somebody with. We want to see more people sitting in these seats on Wednesday nights. So, well, I think that's it for my few announcements. Don't forget that um, this weekend is Christmas Eve, because I, I was worried you were going to forget that. <laughs> were you going to forget that? So Saturday night is the 23rd, and Pastor Jim will be here for regular service Saturday night. Sunday is the 24th, and so there's no 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. Don't come in the morning, but we have our 2 and 4 p.m. candlelight service. Another great place to invite people to. I just read an article that said Christmas was like the biggest invite opportunities for church. I just talked to somebody that works at another church, and they said on Christmas they see four times the attendance because people invite people, and it's like bigger than Easter. And so our candlelight service has a lot of you know traditional Christmas music, Christmas carols, candlelights. It's a very kind of inviting, warm, safe place to invite a family member or a friend. So bring somebody to church. Um, and then once again, next Wednesday, no service, no service. You all be recovering from your Christmas cookies and gatherings and all that good stuff. So are you ready? Should we go into this? Do you have a good attitude? I always say take your church mask off and put it under your seat. <laughs> Just be the real you, come as you are. Um, okay, let's pray one more time. You can never have too much of that, and then we'll get going. So, Lord, once again, we come to you, Lord. We come to you with open hearts. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Ghost speaks through me tonight, Lord, that there will be things that are shared that will challenge us. Father, comfort us, encourage us. Lord, that you would just be present with us tonight. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're going to start with a familiar verse. I will then share what the title is tonight, but this is kind of our, I'm going to call it our core verse for the message, and it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's not a new verse. It's a very familiar verse for most people. I'm first going to read it in the New King James Version, which I'm guessing a lot of you just have this memorized, but it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Familiar verse, right? Yeah. Okay, now I want to read it from the message translation, which I love sometimes just how it nails you down. It says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Guilty? Anybody? Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. I like how it says it there. So I'm well aware that it's, you know, as I said, only a few days until Christmas, and we might not have some people in the room because of all the extra stress of the things that they're trying to execute in the next few days. Some people are maybe at the mall right now. We'll probably say it's men, yeah? (laughs) Uh, Some people might be home and they're just wrapping gifts and they're watching online. And, you know, it's just really can be a stressful time of year And it's not always merry, and it's not always happy. And so I, on a side note, will you please be mindful of that as you go into different celebrations or you chat with people? For some people, this is a really challenging time. If they've maybe lost somebody this year that's important to them, it's a really difficult time to experience the holidays, maybe without that loved one in their life. Um, Some people just don't have great holiday memories, and it just is an anniversary of things that are not always positive. So be mindful of that. Um, Be on the lookout for opportunities God might give you to encourage or pray with somebody. But I thought, of course, it's only fitting to provide you with some type of message tonight that might equip you for the days that are to come, because you might be trying to figure out a lot on your own. Like that verse tells us, don't try to figure it out. You might be doing that. You've maybe been doing that for the past couple weeks. So the title of my message tonight is called The Movie in My Mind. The Movie in My Mind. And it was inspired by a message I heard several years ago that Pastor Stephen Furtick did in, a tri- in his Triggered series. And now I'm not going to re-preach his message or anything like that, but the statement that he shared about the movie in my mind has stuck with me for a lot of years. And it was one of those messages for me that like something just dropped, something just clicked, and it really helped me um, release some things. And it's reminded me of the importance of letting God be in charge of my life and not trying to figure everything else out by myself. And so while... I'll kind of share this concept tonight in the light of the holidays and the upcoming, you know, events you have. This really is an essential and something that will play out in your life all year long. We're not just trying to figure things out on the holidays. That's something that happens really in our lives all year long. So the movie in in my mind, when I say that, refers to like your, maybe the dreams or the desires or the plans that we kind of believe will play out in our life. It's like a script that we've written that we're watching play in our mind. This is what my house is going to look like. This is what marriage will be like. This is what it will look like when my kids grow up and what they are going to be when they grow up. And so whether you want to admit it or not, we all create these movies in our mind. Okay, how many of you are one of those people, it's okay to raise your hand, that watches Hallmark Christmas movies? Okay, we got some Hallmark Christmas movie fans in here. I am not one of them, but it's just not my thing. But I 
I was fascinated with, I'm like, why are so many people like into this? They're like, I can't wait for, you know, Hallmark's Countdown to Christmas and like all of these movies. And I'm like, what is the deal with these movies? And so I, I started to read up on it. And I found an article that talks about why people like love to watch these Hallmark Christmas movies. So I wanted to share a few things about it. And so the article is called The Hallmark Movie Popularity Paradox. And it says that, and this was written in 2022, so it's a little over a year old, but it said the company's collection of holiday-themed films has swelled to over 100 movies. This was in January of 22, with no signs of slowing anytime soon, and they were planning to add 41 more films. And so that would put us at, like, coming into 2023, 150, like, Hallmark Christmas movies. And it said their Christmas movies typically cost about $800,000 to make, which is super cheap for a movie. Some cost like $70 million, okay? They cost $800,000 to make, and their entire production cycle is usually only about three months. So it's like they're cheap, they can turn them out fast. But they're super profitable and practically guaranteed, it says, to rack up like millions of views. And so a press release that they did, the Hallmark Channel, in 2020, they were the most watched entertainment cable network in the fourth quarter of the year and second for the whole year. So it's like people are into these Hallmark Christmas movies. And so this is what I hear people say all the time. And so I'm like, why do you keep watching them? I don't get this. Almost every Hallmark movie, with a few exceptions, can be boiled down to the same formulaic plot. A hardworking woman meets a conventionally attractive man after a recent hardship, falls in love, and has her problems solved in an incredibly convenient way, all in time to usher in the holidays and live happily ever after. <laughs> you all are shaking your head like, yep, yep. And so I'm like, if every movie is like that, like, don't you get bored? Like, I don't get it. Why do people want to watch a hundred movies of the same story? <laughs> And so I'm like, okay, Trina, keep reading, keep reading. And um, I keep reading, and, and a person was asked, like, you know, same question, like, why? And it says, people tend to watch cheesy Hallmark movies around the holidays because it's positive, even though it's predictable. Although the movie may not be that great, it provides a temporary glimpse of optimism. So it's like, okay, we will watch these cheap movies that are cheesy, not really that great, because it gives us some sense of optimism. And I'm like, gosh, that's interesting. Obviously, that's a need that God should be meeting for us. I'm not saying we should never watch Hallmark movies or anything. But... And then it wrapped up. They interviewed a licensed therapist, and she said... It appeals to viewers' senses of nostalgia for the holidays. The holidays run on nostalgia and things that make people happy, and Hallmark movies give people that. Hmm. Solario, now you know why you watch all those Hallmark movies. And so then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna search what are some of the like movie titles from these Hallmark movies? And I'm like, are these the movies that are playing in your mind? Is this the movie in your mind? And so as I like say these Hallmark movie titles, maybe pay attention to the imagery that comes to you. And there might be some of you going like, yep, seen that one, seen that one, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so just think about these titles and the imagery. The Christmas Secret, A Boyfriend for Christmas, when angels come to town, moonlight and mistletoe, an old-fashioned Christmas, love's Christmas journey, merry matrimony, Christmas everlasting, Christmas in evergreen, a gingerbread romance, the mistletoe promise, Christmas Under Wraps, A Dog Named Christmas. <laughs> That's where I'll end my list, but I mean, there's like apparently 150 of them. <laughs> and so um, I'm gonna have the team, they're gonna be putting some images on the screen. And so maybe the movie in your mind looks like 
some of those Hallmark titles, and maybe it looks like some of these images that they're going to show on the screen. And so I'll have them put the first one, the first one up. Okay. See that? Oh. Look, a Christmas wedding, right? Out in the snow. Everybody looks so pretty and beautiful. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Oh, don't you just want your living room to look like that for Christmas? Is that the movie in your mind? Oh, I'm just going to update my living room. I'm going to have the perfect Christmas tree and, and look at the throw blanket and the pillows on the couch. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, look at this holiday dinner. Everybody is there at the table. They're happy. They're, look, Grandpa, he's there, you know. He's, he's up there smiling. Everybody's just jolly having Christmas dinner together. Is that the movie in your mind? Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, look at, look at the kids. They're just getting along so well on Christmas. They're super excited together to see what's in that box. They're not fighting over the box. Just, oh, they just can't wait to see what's in the box. And mom and dad, do you see them? They're sitting in the back just, you know, adoring this wonderful moment with their, with their children. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, here's another great one. Like, we're all opening presents. Everybody's happy. Look, they're sitting on the couch together. I'm sure the kids are just so patient, letting everybody open one gift at a time. <laughs> it just looks so perfect. Okay, the next one. Oh, yes, you were able to buy that new Xbox, you know, for your teenager that wanted that expensive Christmas present. Oh, they opened the Xbox, and they were so thankful. And so I go through those to just kind of see, you know, what does that trigger for you? What are the movies in your mind about the holidays in particular? But sometimes we are, like, practically killing ourselves to make these movies become a reality in our life. I'm not saying we can't have like nice little Christmas atmosphere and put up your tree and have a nice dinner and like some people are better at that than others and some are more like Martha Stewart than others but like are you just literally like killing yourself to keep up with the Joneses and put this like beautiful Christmas holiday together and the question is in like reality let's say you did do that what message does it give to us of ourselves if are we saying like if my living room looks like that like that means i'm okay or if my kids get the gifts they want that means i'm good enough there's some kind of messaging that we've internalized about having this perfect movie play out in our houses in our lives over the holidays Okay, on the flip side, I haven't forgotten about those of you where these images and movie titles seem like a total joke because maybe your entire life has been filled with family dysfunction, miserable holidays, addictions, anger, broken family relationships, loneliness, and more. I mean, that's a reality for a lot of people. And so maybe the movie in your mind is one that is completely opposite of everything that I've said and everything that I've shown, all the things that I've rattled off. Well, or maybe your movie titles sound the same, but they look a little different. Okay, we're going to take a couple more of those and flip it. Okay, one of them was called The Christmas Secret. Okay, not, I'm not ready for the picture quite yet, but she's cute, isn't she? The Christmas Secret. Okay, that could be about like addiction, hatred, what, what other kind of family secrets are going on during the holidays, right? An old-fashioned Christmas. Well, old-fashioned is a kind of a drink. What about Christmas under wraps? Well, that just might be, you know, you don't want to share with anyone and expose the craziness of your family. So we could take some of those Hallmark movies and just completely flip the script and turn them into the dysfunctional Christmas movies. That might be fun. Somebody could probably make some money doing that. But okay, let's go with the next images because this might be more like what your Christmas looks like. Okay, we got like, you thought you were going to cook like this perfect Christmas meal and all of a sudden you're like, I need to get the fire extinguisher out. Okay, you can go to the next one. Now it's just, she's just burnt the turkey. 
right? You can tell she's like exhausted. She's burnt the turkey. All right, we'll go to that next one. And so here's mom and dad like yelling in the background. The kid has her hands over her ears like, oh my gosh, will you guys stop fighting? I don't know if your kids have ever said that to you. I'm going to tell you a story before we go to the last image. But this was an unhappy holiday story that I realized I had a movie in my mind. And it happened right here at Living Word Christian Center. And so several years ago, my kids were still fairly young, and we decided as a family that we were going to go do the Baskets of Blessing outreach, you know, which we still do. But back then, all of them were delivered. Now, we did do some delivery this year, but it's been more of a pickup thing. So all of them were delivered. And so I don't think a lot of people back then still had, like, smartphones and used Google and all that type of stuff. And so if you were delivering baskets, say, to, like, three or four families, they gave you a printed piece of paper with directions that were created by MapQuest. <laughs> Has it been a while since you've heard that? MapQuest. Okay. Okay. And so I don't know, we maybe got like two or three baskets or something. And so the movie in my mind is like, we're going on a family outing and we're going to teach our kids about the importance of giving in the community and helping those out that are less fortunate than us. And we're going to get in the car and we're going to have Christmas music on and we're going to deliver these baskets to these families and they're going to be so thankful and they're going to be so grateful and it's going to be like the best Saturday morning ever. That was my movie in my mind, okay? So we get going. My husband's here. He's the one, you know, stuck driving with us, you know, my two daughters and us. And so I don't know if it was the first basket or the last basket, but we, we get on the map quest and we're doing what it says. And it basically brings us to nowhere. Okay, like not to a house. And I think the address was like 64 and a half street or something does that? Who makes half streets? Like, what is the point of that? But I don't think MapQuest enjoyed like half halves when you enter that into the address. And so, you know, we're a little, we start to get like a little frustrated. We're like, oh, like, you know, what the heck? We're, we can't find where we need to go. And, and so we start trying to figure it out. And we're all, my poor husband's driving and we're like, I think it's over there. I think you missed that turn. And I'm sure I had the paper and like, no, you needed to go left here. And we ended up at, I think like two or three like dead ends. Like we, we could not find the house. And so the kids are trying to be helpful. And then, you know, he, he decides, like, well, they give you the phone number. So we try to call the family to say, like, hey, we want to deliver you your basket. We can't find your house. So, of course, he calls. They don't answer, probably because they're like, who's this strange number calling me? He leaves a message. We keep trying to find the house. So like, all of us are yelling at each other at this point. <laughs> He's trying to drive. I'm going to go left. One kid's probably going, I think it was back there. Okay, we had like the biggest family fight. I don't know. Maybe some of you fight on the way to church as well. That's usually how the devil works. Get you all mad and whooped up. So eventually the person called back and we did get the basket to them. But like at that point, it was just like, let's just get this done with. We just want to get home and like get out of this car with each other. And so that was one example of, I had this movie in my mind of this perfect experience, and it didn't go that way. And it kind of represented, like, the kids probably going, like, will you all quit yelling at each other? Okay, let's go to the last image. We'll see who can recognize this one. <laughs> this was from the movie Christmas Vacation. And if you've seen that, you know that he probably had a lot of movies in his mind as well, and they did not turn out so well. So this is him outside, you know, cutting down a tree with his, like, Jason mask on there. And so thank you to the TV team in the back for keeping up with me on all those images. But it may not even seem possible sometimes to have a scenario that feels like normal. And we all want to be, like the director in our movies, right? I had the movie in my mind, like, okay, we're doing Baskets of Blessing, family. Everybody get in the car, you in the back, you in the front. This is going to be an amazing event. Put on Cool 108. It's time for the Christmas, Christmas music, right? And, I, you know, I'm going to direct the whole little scene. 
and things kind of went sideways. And so <laughs> I looked up, well, what is the role of a director in a movie? There's a director, there's a producer, you know, there's all these different roles. And it indicates that a director is responsible for shaping the overall vision and direction of the film. I guess it makes sense that a director is responsible for the direction of the film. And so if we're honest, right, we like to be in control. We want to sit in this chair. We want to sit in this director's chair, and we want to control everything, and we want to control everybody, and we're just going to keep our hands in there and go like, yes, you do over this. Yes, yep, right, point, point, you go. You do that. I want to be in control. It's got quiet in here. Does anybody else besides me want to do that sometimes? Okay. And so we like deciding our own vision. We like deciding the direction we want to go. And we believe that life would be so much easier if we could just control everything and everyone. We want to be the ones sitting in the director's chair. We want to be shouting orders out this megaphone. But one thing that we have to remind ourselves is that we have limitations in our understanding. Remember that core verse? Lean not under your own understanding. <laughs> Quit trying to think that you know it all. So let's go to a few more verses that describe this and prove that we don't always know everything. We have some limits. So 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And you might go like, what are, you, what are you going there for? This is the love chapter. 1 Corinthians is always known as the love chapter. Well, it is. You know, So the context of this verse is about understanding perfected love. Yet I think the verse can broadly apply to our general understanding of many spiritual things. So I believe this is from the NLT. Yeah. It says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. Then, not now. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Newsflash, God knows you better than you know you. <laughs> okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.9. That's another you know, well-known verse. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So after like just looking at those few verses, it seems really clear that we are not supposed to be the director of our own lives. We don't know everything. It says that what we know is imperfect, puzzling, partial, incomplete, and unimaginable, yet we try to be over here directing the movie of our life. Hmm. We need God to be the director. We need him to reveal to us his magnificent plans. And sometimes the hard part is he does it on his timing, not ours. <laughs> his timing, not our timing. Can you think of a time when you sat in that director's chair and your plans didn't work out so well? Probably all of us. Probably all of us, yeah. Is there a time maybe that you dug your heels in so you could just do it your way? I'm just going to do it my way. And then maybe it backfired. God was probably like, I was trying to work this out for you. You just had to get yourself involved. You just had to do it your way. So I, I, I seem to have always had a movie in my mind when it came to my kids. And while it's normal for parents, right, to have hopes and dreams for their kids, I think sometimes we try to be the director in their lives instead of teaching them to be in tune with the voice of God. I realize when they're young and they're little, yes, we have to help them, we have to direct them. It's our job as parents to raise them and teach them. But at a certain point, it's our job to help them learn how to follow God and, and listen to their own spirit. And so my kids grew up in this church. They went to Maranatha. And I had a movie in my mind about what their lives and their relationship with God would look like. Any other parents? Or if you're a parent, raise your hand. Okay, we have some parents. Yeah. Yeah. And so that movie in my mind drove how I interacted with them 
it led to me like nagging them about certain things, whether it's like, well, this is what their perfect room is going to look like and it should be clean, or I maybe nagged them about going to church more. And so my movie had my kids, you know, that they desired to work in ministry like me. It had them like at the altar every, every service with their like hands raised, like worshiping Jesus. It had them sharing Christ with others. I had it all planned out and thought that my perfect parenting formula would guarantee that outcome. Boy, was I wrong. Um, I should have instead been seeking the Lord for how to pray for them and how to support the plan that he had for them. Did I even ask God what did he have in store for my kids? Don't, I, I can't, I don't think I did. And so I just sat right here in the director's chair trying to call all the shots for my kids as well as myself. My kids are doing great, but it doesn't match the movie that was in my mind for many years. And when I finally let go of that, it brought a lot of freedom. And that's why the, the message that I heard the first time from Pastor Stephen was that's like what settled in me. Like, you're, you're all uptight and distressed about this and this and this. And realizing like it was because of the movie that was in my mind. And I wasn't trusting God to be the director in their lives either. You may have done a similar thing when it comes to your kids or your marriage. What does the movie in your mind look like when it comes to marriage? Because TV isn't really truth, is it? <laughs> romance novels and romance movies, that's not always true. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's not total marital bliss every day. I would guess anybody that's married or, you know, or been in relationships knows that there's some challenging parts to marriage. Many marriages, I think, fail because of unrealistic expectations that we have for that other person or our belief that we can change them into who we want them to be. Oh, I can change that. I think probably women might do that more than men, but oh, I can change that about them. Maybe, not likely. And so the movie in our mind, I think, can really destroy or even kill a marriage if we're trying to hold somebody to some expectation that they don't even know about. We're trying to change them to be somebody that God doesn't want them to be. Let's take a look at a few stories in Scripture to help us demonstrate that, guess what? Even in Bible times, they have the same struggle. I like that when I can find and go like, yep, they dealt with that thousands of years ago, just like we do. So let's first talk about Sarah and Abraham. And so Abraham was told by God that he would be a great nation. He believed God for a while, but when God seemed to be slow in keeping his promise, Abraham and Sarah moved into the director's role, their chair, and they just flat out added a scene to their movie. They added a scene. We'll talk about that in a minute. Abraham slept with Hagar. That was the scene that they added into the movie. He took the plans into his own hands rather than trusting God as his divine director. So let's read um, bits of that story and see what we can learn. And we do sometimes choose to add scenes when we perceive that God's not moving fast enough. I need something now, God. I want this to happen now. And so we work hard to make it happen now. And then we add scenes into the movie or add things to the script that shouldn't be there. So let's go to Genesis 12. Uh, this is 2 through 3 in the New Living Translation. It says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So here's a time right there where he's telling Abraham, like, you're going to be a great nation. And he's kind of going like, hmm, don't have any kids. Hmm. Genesis 12, 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. All right, so now the Lord appears to him, and he's like, you're going to have a bunch of descendants. 
And he's kind of like, okay, God, I'm going to believe you. But guess what? Still no kids. If we go to Genesis 15, 1 through 6, so this is also in the New Living Translation, it says, Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? So finally, he's kind of like, I'm getting impatient here. I don't, <laughs> Since you've given me no children, a laser of Damascus, a servant in my household will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky, count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So, I mean, how many times has God said, like, you're going to have descendants, you're going to have descendants, you're going to have an heir? And I don't know if I could have been as patient as he was for as long as he was. I might have started inserting scenes into my movie as well. And so we can see that Abraham was doubting, but he did choose to keep God in the director's chair. He's just like, okay, Lord, believed him. If you keep reading, just multiple times the Lord continues to speak about his descendants. Then we get to Genesis 16. This is where they insert the scene. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. So this happened like 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So he's been waiting a long time. He's been patient and trusting God in this whole movie script. If we go to Genesis 16:11. It says, and the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all of his relatives. That's what happens when you insert scenes into your script. Do you think that was the movie that Abraham and Sarah had? Was that their son will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey that he'll raise his fist against everybody? I don't think so. I don't think things turned out as planned when they decided to kind of take the movie into their own hands. But guess what? God is always merciful, isn't he? <laughs> God is merciful, and even though they did take things into their own hands, we know that Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. That's good news. So we can get out of the director's chair and give it to God at any time. So at some point, Abraham did that. They took it over for a bit, right? They took it over, added a scene, called some shots, but then they gave it back to God. And Isaac, son of promise, was born. So one more, one more Bible story. You still with me? Yeah. What time is it? 8.15. All right, I'm okay. And this kind of fits well with the Christmas holiday because many of us might be hosting guests. And so this is the story of Mary and Martha, one of my favorite stories. And I will admit, most of the time, I identify more with Martha. But in that same message that Stephen Furtick preached, he talked about appreciating Martha because if he didn't have some Marthas on his church staff, who's going to get anything done around here, right? <laughs> and so let's read about Mary and Martha. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. 
Later, she stepped in, interrupting them. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. Only one thing, or sorry, one thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. So I don't know about you, if you get stressed out in the kitchen when you have a lot of guests over and you're frustrated that your sister or your spouse or whoever is just like out there hamming it up, having a good time, and you're working your tail off in the kitchen, you know, maybe you see yourself in that story. And so what do you think was the movie that was in Martha's mind? I think she was just like, Jesus is coming over. I'm just, I'm just going to make this perfect, perfect atmosphere. I'm going to put the throw blanket on the back of the chair, and he's going to come, and he's going to be so impressed with my home and my hospitality. And he's going to walk in and go, Martha, it just looks amazing in here. The smell, what are you burning, right? So in her mind, she's got this movie about what it's going to be like when Jesus arrives. And she think, I think in her movie, she also had Mary helping with the preparations. And so her and Mary are going to be in the kitchen, like working together, maybe telling stories like, oh, I'll chop up the vegetables and you get the dip out or whatever it might be. So her movie included just this moment of, of, of Mary making sure everything was in order before Jesus came. And then I think once things played out the way it did, her movie was like, oh, I know Jesus. He's going to tell Mary that she needs to get her butt in here and help me in the kitchen. So she had like this movie in her mind about what this visit from Jesus was going to be like in her home. And it didn't go as planned. I bet that Martha was slamming the cupboards, clanking the pots very loudly to let everybody know that she needed help. I'm guessing there were grunts and groans and sighs, and I will admit I've probably done this before. This could be your holiday gathering. You want to make sure everybody knows how hard you've worked and how miserable you really are. <laughs> well, what else can we learn from this movie in Martha's mind? Well, one thing we can learn is, you know what? Martha extended the invite. And don't extend the invite if you don't want to do the work. That's just basic. If Christmas or any other event is going to stress you out, make you mad at everybody, don't do it. Or modify it to be manageable. We turn, especially the holidays, into a lot of have-tos. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do that. Who says you have to? You did. This is you over here saying that you have to. It was your choice. Another thing we can learn, don't expect people to read your mind. I think she thought Mary should read her mind, Jesus should read her mind, they should all be in their kitchen like helping her. If you need help, ask for it. Okay, I'm getting better at this, but I've not accomplished this either. But if you need help, ask for it. If people offer to help, take it. Let somebody bring a side dish, even if it's gross. <laughs> Let them bring the soggy green bean casserole or whatever it's going to be. Let somebody else stay help late to help with cleanup if they want. I feel like ladies were a little bit more guilty of this than the guys. But don't expect people to read your mind. Don't reject everybody's help. And then... The other thing we can learn from the story is don't forget the purpose of the gathering. Jesus reiterated the purpose, which was about relationship and ministry. And so many of our holiday gatherings have lost their purpose. Once again, Trina's guilty of this. I want my guests to have a really good experience, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if by the time everybody leaves, I've talked to nobody and sat and talked to nobody, was that really worth it? And so the dishes will still be there when it's over. And there's times like I can get the dishes done in a quick amount of time and, you know, sit down and visit. But don't forget the purpose of the gathering. Jesus didn't expect that Martha would do nothing. 
I mean, I'm sure he still showed up expecting to have something to eat and a chair to sit on or, you know, whatever. He didn't expect that she would do nothing, but she made the tasks the primary focus. That's what he was frustrated with. She allowed herself to lose sight of the purpose or the plot of the movie. So we need to adjust. We have to give up this role here, people, and say we have a divine director who is ready to write our script and direct our movie. And we have to just adjust and like give up that role. So are we omniscient or is God omniscient? God. God. Can you say that? God. <laughs> are we the source of ultimate wisdom or is God the source? God. Are we sovereign or is God sovereign? God. Look, you got three out of three. Good job. So if we want the movie in our mind to be one that comes true, then we need to shift to letting God sit in that chair. Get your butt out of the chair and let him sit in the chair and be the divine director of your life. Another familiar verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Who knows the plans? God knows the plans. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Another verse. Familiar. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Once again, I think the word makes it really clear who knows what's happening and who should be sitting in the director's chair. Can anybody, anybody object, disagree? I don't know. I could probably find some more verses, but... I think it's pretty clear. His ways are better than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We see everything just in such a limited sense. So it's time for us to in a, like surrender the script. It's important to give up that control to God, let go of our plans, our movies, and trust in his divine purpose. Way easier said than done. I know that. So I generally always have some how-tos, like, how do, how do we do that, Trina? How do we do this? How do we give up this role of sitting in the director's chair? Well, let's go back to that core scripture that we started with. It says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one that will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. I feel like that was kind of like our steps right there. He's telling us what to do. So first one, don't try to figure everything out. Well, how do I play that out in my own life? To me, that's really about prayer and meditation. Prayer is communication with God. We hear from God when we take time to talk to God and listen to God. Does the script you have match what God has spoken to you? Have you ever even really asked him? As I said earlier, I don't know that I had maybe asked him the questions I needed to about my kids. Have you asked him that about your own life? Like, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Or are you just doing the things that you kind of like to do or your parents told you you were probably going to do? So it's really important to spend time in prayer and meditation so you can talk to God and listen to what he might have to say. Uh, John 6 from the Amplified Classic, it says, But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will write your script. He will tell you what's in the script, but you need to talk to him about the script through prayer and meditation. There's also things we can do just to seek God's general will through scripture. There's a lot that's written in scripture about his general will for all of our lives. Many parts of our our script are the same, right? There's specific things God teaches about how do we love others? How do we prioritize our life? How do we conduct ourselves in relationships? 
So it's important that we get ourselves in the word, in the written word, as another way to find out what's in my script. How am I supposed to interact in this situation or this scene of my life? Just read your word. Number two out of that verse said, listen for God's voice in everything that you do. I know that's kind of self-explanatory. I feel like one of the most helpful books early on for me was that Kenneth Hagin book, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God. And I mean, it just even uses that basic example of like, kind of like a red light or a green light and kind of just like you have that hunch, you have that gut feeling, you just have like, "Eh, don't do that. Like there's just some basic things that God's not always going to like speak to you like, yes, child, or no, child. It's just like you you just kind of got that knowing or that feeling. And so when you're in certain situations, like just be conscious and mindful, like, okay, God, like what do you want me to do in this situation? And maybe you just get some kind of prompting or some type of leading, and sometimes you just don't know, and you're like, have to say, like, you know, I'm not sure what to do. I'm just going to take a minute to pray. So just being conscious of listening for God's voice in everything that you do. Number three is obey. And this is probably the hardest part, right? And as I was putting this together in my notes, I go, I feel like every single sermon I ever preach has this last step in it that says obey. Like it's in every single thing I say. And once again, it's easier said than done. But when we obey... What it requires us to do is trust him fully. That's where we are fully letting him sit in this chair all by himself without us trying to like, you know, push him out, sit on his lap or any of that. Like, let him fully sit here, obey what he's asked us to do. It requires patience. It requires faith. Sometimes we have a lot of questions. We're like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here. I don't know how long this is going to take but I'm going to stand on what you've spoken to me, maybe to my heart, in your written word, whatever it might be. So as we close, I want to take some, I want you, I'm going to do it too, but take some time with God in the coming weeks and figure out what scripts do you need to submit to him. Maybe it's, it might be a negative script of like, this is what marriage is and this is what marriage is always going to be and I'm never going to be happy and my kids are always going to do this. It's a, there's sometimes negative scripts that we have to say like, that does not line up with God's word. It might be positive dreamy scripts that we have put together like those Hallmark movies that aren't necessarily what God has spoken for our life either. So taking some time and just let's run our scripts by the Lord and go like, are these, did you write these or did I write these? Who wrote these? Did my mom write these? Who wrote these scripts? Is the movie in your mind directed by him or is it directed by you? What do you need to surrender and give up? Do you think Christmas should look like a Hallmark movie? Do you have plans for your marriage and your kids and others that you've never submitted to God? It's like you got to submit your scripts and go like, is this approved? Does this need edits? Did you check all the grammar? (laughs) This is a great concept to think about going into Christmas, but as I said earlier, this needs to become a life principle. This is truly an essential, which is the name, you know, of the series that we've been in. This is an essential about letting God be the director of our lives. So I want to wrap up with our opening scripture again. It's the trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I think I'll have you say it with me. Probably a lot of you know it from memory. They might be able to get it up on the screen quick enough. I'm not sure there, but all right. Are you ready? Ready. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. All right, let's pray, and then I get to send you on out here. Look, 8.30, I did it right on the money. Wow, all right. So, Father God, we come to you tonight, and Lord, we make a decision to submit our scripts to you. Father, we, we're just going to run every single script by you from now on. Lord, we don't want to sit in this chair and make mistakes and control everything and everyone and insert scenes in our life that aren't of you. 
Lord, I just ask that you would continue to show us, lead us, and guide us just as your word promised and all that you have for us. Father, help us not only to let go maybe of the unrealistic scripts, but Lord, also the scripts that we've made to be too negative, Father, that we remember the promises of God and how much you love and care for us. Lord, I thank you that as we go into our holiday gatherings, Father, that we don't have to be angry about the chores and the tasks. Father, we remember the purpose and the plot of the movie called Christmas. Father, that we will be a blessing to those, to our family members and our friends that we gather with. Lord, that your presence would be evident. Lord, and that we remember the gift of your son Jesus coming into this earth. Lord, I thank you for this group of people. I just ask that their holiday and their new year would be so blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So don't forget to come to church this weekend to hear Pastor Jim, Christmas Eve services, but don't come back here next Wednesday. There is no service. Thank you so much for coming to church tonight. I hope you were blessed. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much for being here for church. Thank you for being the church. Uh, it's so important to be a community here together, to be the church family. Uh, I want to make sure that you get connected. You become part of this church community. You can go to lwcc.org slash online church or uh, connect with us at our LWCC online church Facebook group. Uh, these are ways that we can be a community together uh, to be able to celebrate and encourage each other each and every day uh, to keep that Christmas spirit alive. When we celebrate Jesus every day, we keep that Christmas spirit going all year long. Thank you for being here. God bless you and have an amazing week.